Master class, Growing Readers. The class will be facilitated by teacher librarians Katie Day and Nadine Bailey. This class will cover new research, trends, and practices in promoting reading among children and young people. Katie Day is an American who has been overseas for over 30 years. She has a master's in children's literature from the UK and teaching and librarian degrees from Australia, earned long distance while living in Asia. Active in international school teacher librarian networks, she has been heavily involved in the development and management of the Red Dot Book Awards in Singapore and the Bangkok Book Awards in Thailand. She's currently working at Tanglin Trust School in Singapore and has also lived in Thailand, Vietnam, Hong Kong and the UK. Online, she uses the, library, the librarian Edge as a blog and Twitter handle. Nadine Bailey is an experienced teacher librarian. She has lived and worked in Asia for 16 years, the last eight in the IB environment. She is now the middle school teacher librarian at the American School of Dubai. Nadine is passionate about diversity and enhancing a multicultural, multilingual environment. She's been involved in the NBA and Neve Festival since its inception. Please welcome Katie and Nadine. Oh, okay, so the first thing we want to say is that we always give you the slides. So we have too many slides. We're going to be going fast, but you can always go back later and watch everything and read everything on your own. In the last slide, we'll repeat this QR code and repeat the short URL. So that's us. That's how you can find us on Twitter. And we're going to start with the research update, go on to talk about some social depth, and then matchmaking. So first for the research, why read? I think this audience, we're going to assume we don't really need to convince you of that. But just in case, we're going to give you some research on why you should read and why you should read fiction. But we're going to start by running a minute and a half of this four minute video, which comes from Elaine de Baton's School for Life out of London, and it's just fun. So you can go and why read fiction? Elaine de Baton will tell you in a funny way, but I can tell you that one thing he says is that it's a great reality simulator. And here is some research that does say that engaging with fiction and fictional characters is like training mode, it's like a flight simulator for pilots. So you can try out things without having to really go through it yourself. So some other research says, very recent research talks about how reading complex, meaning literary fiction, gives you a more complex worldview. And they really make the point that it's not just reading very formulaic um, romance books, but at a young age, if you read complex fiction, literary, the things your teachers try to get you to understand, you later on will be more nuanced in seeing the world as a complex place. And this is a really fun thing that is free on the internet. I don't know for how long, but in honor of the Queen's death, the London Review of Books has made available this short story. It's kind of a long short story by Alan Bennett, who's a very, very funny man. And he wrote this story, and it's published in book form too. And it imagines what would happen if Queen Elizabeth one night with her little corgis goes out to the back of Buckingham Palace and she sees a mobile library. And as the queen, she feels I should go in and talk to my subjects. And then she thinks she should take out a book and so she takes out a book. And it starts this chain of events that takes the queen to some place that she rather unexpected. And it's about the benefits of reading literary fiction. So go and get it while it's still not behind the paywall. So, what about the learning to read, and what is the latest research on that? Well, there are the, these things called the reading wars, which I'm sure the teachers in the room will have heard of, the parents might not have, but it's this big debate for many years over whether you should teach stress phonics or stress whole language. Is it about decoding skills or about comprehension? Is it about the science of reading versus balanced literacy? And it just so happens that on September 1st in The New Yorker, they published this nice long article about the reading wars. And it gets into 
Um, Lucy Calkins is uh, an academic who's behind a lot of the, um, the whole language movement and how she was made to put more phonics in her thing because they said, well, these kids in New York City, they're not learning to read. You need phonics. So very good article. I would encourage you to go read it. And I love how the author calls it vibes-based literacy because the criticism is saying that this whole language mode that kids are just having to get the vibe. They're just having, trying to guess the meaning from the pictures and that they're not being taught concrete skills. Now, as the article will make clear, it could be the size of the classroom could make the difference, how many children. There's a lot of other factors. So the simplification doesn't hold up. And we all know Marianne Wolf has been here in a neat thing. I mean, we've been in book groups with her, but she is one of the proponents of the saying that reading is the most unnatural thing and that we all have to learn how to do it. And a little bit more of a stress, and she comes to, does come from a dyslexic research background of this decoding. But I recently heard this um, Professor Carol Block from South Africa talk, and this is an, a wonderful article that I would highly recommend. And she is coming from South Africa where she's looking at how literacy is taught to a large number of children from, from poor backgrounds, which it might be interesting for you to read and think, how much does it relate to India? And she would argue that she looks at, but how does comprehension really come about? And does it come from the bottom up? Is it that you have to learn all these decoding schools before you're being allowed to have any meaning? And I guess South Africa passed some law that said every child by the age of 10 must be able to read for meaning or else the schools will you know, have a failing grade. And she says, seriously? You want to wait until they're 10 years old before making sure that they can read for meaning? She says, it's crazy. She argues, and she has all this nice research to back it up, that language is learned by living in and interacting in a culture and it's this very much a reinforcing virtuous cycle of, in, of decoding and, and, and getting meaning and that went off the screen a little bit and the thing is that children learn you, we, we have brains that learn statistical pattern learning and prediction through song, rhyme, poetry and games exactly what was on the stage right before we got up here Right? That this is how the brain learns to understand. Even I, listening to it, I thought maybe I could learn Hindi. If somebody is like rhythmically telling me and then I'm going to come to anticipate what should be the next word, right? And, um, and I love Danushka Ravishankar up here this morning. And that's exactly, it's the nonsense, it's the rhyming. It's to look at that and to think that it's funny, but then to also absorb what the letter I is doing. This is a more powerful way of learning than this straight decoding that the, the brain is a Bayesian machine, iteratively predicting meaning based on content. Now, Bayesian logic is what you'd hear about Google. Why is it when we type a word into Google? It's predicting what it thinks we want to search for, right? And Nadine and I both are kind of laughing and, and saying this thing of also when if a child looks at a word, can they just gather the meaning without absolutely knowing every single phonics in it? Yes. Um, and so you want to say what you... Yeah, I've been trying to learn Arabic because I've moved to Dubai. And I totally guess what the word is. I look at the first and last uh, letter and how long the word is, and I'm guessing what it is. So I'm just experiencing it and reading this. It was so funny to think, oh my gosh, that's how I'm learning as an adult learner. And then I do Wordle every day, and it is. It's based on my knowledge of English. I'm trying to guess, but I'm predicting what could the word be based on my, the, what I think about the frequency. Do we all decode all the time? Did you just decode that, or did you get the meaning? Does it matter that there's a mistake in there? Your brain just fills in the gaps, even if it's wrong, right? There are two U's. And that Carol Block makes the point that audiobooks, we're reading to our brains, it doesn't matter. Both of them help us. Learning oral language is just as good. And so that's why things like Storyweaver is wonderful. Listening counts. Listening matters. When my students say to me, I say, how many books did you read over the summer break? And they'll go, well, not that many. I, I only listen to audiobooks. I'm going, that counts. That counts. Tell me how many audiobooks you listen to. And that our brains, evolution shaped the mind for story, so it could be shaped by story. And Block's big point is that not, not to, and it's funny because I know here we often say, you know, reading is unnatural, language is natural, but actually both are cultural. You know, culture is what's natural, not language. So now, Nadine. Okay. 
I'm now going to talk about social death because when we're growing readers, that's a really important point, is that sometimes children don't want to read because it's the kiss of death socially for them. And in particular, we sometimes find that with young boys. Uh, they'd rather be playing soccer or chatting to their mates or playing video games than reading. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, communicating the benefits of reading. And a few years ago, I was following um, the blog and the podcast of Dave McCraney. And he was talking about trying to convince climate deniers that there was climate change, in fact. And I listened to that and I thought, darn, we're doing exactly the same thing as teachers and librarians and parents in trying to convince our children to read. So those of you who've known me over the last few years, I have a child who loves reading and I have a son who's a very reluctant reader. So I've ch tried everything in the book to convince my son to read. And the big thing here is not to let your passion backfire. And that's what we sometimes do as teachers, right? We tell people and we say things and we give them data and we negate the message because the people we are talking at, because that's not what we're often doing, are becoming terribly defensive. You can see their body language. You can see how they're looking at you um, because we've got this doom and gloom. If you don't read, um, you're going to fail at school. You're not going to be a nice person. Um, we create this um, whole distance between us and them. Cre we set up dissonance with them, and they, they, they'll say things like, well, my grandfather never read, or my husband doesn't read, and I'm not a reader, and they turned out okay, so it's going to be okay, so what you're talking doesn't count. Um, they deny. They'll, they'll just say, no, it's not like that at all. Um, and then they'll say, I'm doing okay because this person's doing worse than me. And then we really attacking their identity because they have this identity that they're a good person and that they're okay and they're doing okay. And we're telling them, no, you're not okay because you're not reading. And then they're like, well, I'm not going to listen to you. And we shut that whole cycle off for them. And so in good form, they offered a few solutions for this. And this is what we're going to focus on when we're growing readers. The first one is to keep things social. Humans and readers and children are social beings. And so the more social we can make reading, the more likely they are to make to think this is fun. So we're not just all sitting alone, but we're reading together, we're discussing books together, we're doing things together. We also want to get, give some signals that they're doing okay, that they're doing fine, that they're doing better than they were doing last week or last year. Um, and life is complicated enough. We want to make reading as simple as possible, books as accessible as possible, checking out books as easy as possible, re returning books as easy as possible. Um, we want to make a supportive a network between school, home, library, teacher, and we want to make sure that we do things in a good storytelling way. So I often tell the story of my son who's a struggling reader, and I tell the story of my daughter who's not a struggling reader, but people can then find themselves, and we're not only telling one story, we're telling many stories. Uh, I did quite a lot of research into social belonging as it pertains to reading. And um, Vygotsky, Dewey, they say, education is a social, it's not an individualistic process. And the research on relatedness and, and, and um, belonging and learning say that we need three things. We need that relatedness, we need autonomy, and we do need competence. So we do actually need to learn how to read. I want to talk about the relatedness. So some of you may have heard my talk on our Blokes with Books Club that I set up with some young students, grade three to grade five. And what did we do? We made reading the most popular club in school. And the boys got together. They did interactive things. They did fun things. They did goofy things. They did stupid things all around reading. And because they felt this sense of belonging, any shame they had with not being able to read or not being able to read well was eliminated. 
Yeah, they had membership cards, and we had a waiting list. And they were waiting for kids to drop out so that they could join, and nobody was dropping out. <laughs> and we did things like look at books on magic, and if they read a book and gave a book uh, review, so it was a quick uh, bookhead heart review, if they gave that, then they'd be able to get the clue to do the magic trick in the next session. And it, it was just such a cool, fun thing to do. So... <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> belongingness is what it says behind there. Um, the research says it is important for student success, for academic attitude and motive, motive, for social and personal attitudes, for engagement and participation, and for academic achievement. So it's not just about reading, it's about belonging, it's about feeling you're part of a learning community. Um, so, so this is that says matchmaking and the role of the teacher librarian. Um, so everyone has a reading story, um, and I'm going to give credit. This was a teacher at NIST school in Bangkok where I worked who had this and would do this with her students. And I do this at the beginning of every year with my students, and we talk about the reading story, and everyone has one. And for some people, reading happens, you might say, like lightning. It's instantaneous. You don't remember learning how to read. It just, it just happened. But for other people, learning to read is like climbing a mountain. And it can be very difficult. And it was a hard journey, a very hard one journey. But for everybody, you at some point, you come to learn to love reading or to love books. And there is the mechanics of it. Or maybe, maybe it's one magic book. Maybe one book turns you into a reader. But whatever it is, whatever the reading story of how you came to know reading, there are three elements. And one is you need the right books. You need the books that mean something to you. When I talk to my students, I'll say, well, The Cat in the Hat is one of my special books because it was written the year I was born, 1957. And it was read to me, and I read it to my three children, and now I have a granddaughter, I'm reading it to her, and that's one. Or maybe it's The Lord of the Rings because my older brother gave it to me when I was in middle school, and I've read The Lord of the Rings four or five times all the way through, so that's one of my right books. The right people, the right people. My brother was the right person for me. He was three years older, and I would go in his bedroom and look at those books, and I aspired to read everything. For some people, it could be the, the teacher librarian. I think that's what we aspire to be, the right person for people. And the, uh, the clock there implies the right conditions, the right time and the right place. And so my students and I, we all have a, a, we raise hands. How many people read in bed? You know, everybody reads in bed. No, some people never read in bed. And then we interview them and say, you never read in bed? No, I never do. But then we split into two camps. Who reads in the morning? Who reads at night? Um, how many people like to eat when they read, right? So what is it, the time and the place for you? Because if you're not given the right conditions, if you don't have that comfy chair, maybe you won't turn into a reader. You need the right conditions. So we did want you to turn and talk with your neighbor here for a minute. And what were the right books for you? What are the right people? The right people, who do you trust? If somebody recommends a book to you, do you always know, like, I definitely want to read that book because I really, really trust that person. So turn and talk. All right, I, I heard some good murmuring, so I hope you did share, or you'll think about this. Now, this slide is one, it comes from design thinking, which talks about the intersection, and, and if you see design thinking, bringing something into the world, you need to consider the desirability. Is it, is it a, a good thing? Does somebody want this thing in the world? And then you have to think about the availability, the viability and the accessibility. And how we teacher librarians interpret this for books is we have to find a book that a child wants to read. It has to be desirable. That could be the cover, that could be because of its popularity. The viability means can we make that book available to them? Can we buy that book? Can we get that book in their hands? Can we buy it as an ebook? Because if they can't get access to the book in that way, then they won't be able to read it. But the I shouldn't have used the word access, because accessibility here, what we mean by feasibility, is it feasible, is it possible that that child can read that book and understand it? And this is where, do they have the right reading skills? Is it at the right reading level? Is it in the right language? Is it 
do they have enough background knowledge to understand this story? Or is it so out of their realm that they're just not going to be able to make the connections to make meaning? And so this is the struggle, or the, we, we, this is our challenge. It's not a struggle. The challenge is to get the right books and to help kids find the right books. And now Nadine's going to talk about her right people. <laughs> the right people. <laughs> so are we surrounded by people who love to read? Are we choosing our friends and our communities based on people who love to read? And places like this where we're surrounded by authors and publishers and librarians and teachers who all love reading, that makes such a huge difference in whether somebody's going to be reading or not. Next one. OK. So we were talking a little bit with a few teenagers and with some teachers, and we were like, you know, when you're a young adult, when you're in the last few years of school, what on earth is going to make you read? Because there are so many demands on your time. There's sports, and there's drama, and there's a school play, and there's applying for college, and, you know, life is quite tough. And we came up with a few ideas, and here's some of the books that we thought matched them. One is books can help you with your anticipation of the future. You've never been to college, but a book about somebody who's just starting college can help you understand what that's all about. Um, someone came up with transactional. If a student knows that if they read good literary books, they're going to do better in their interviews for college. They're going to have more vocabulary for their SAT tests. So there's a kind of transactional nature. If I read, I'm going to get where I want to go. Comparison and reassurance, and here we want to, rain must fall. One thing that most teens most want to know is if they are normal or not. Am I right? Any teens here? Any, any middle graders? How many of you want to just be reassured that you are normal, that there are other people like you out there, that you're not this weird, strange person and the only person in the world who feels like this or behaves like this? Okay, so that's another thing books do, is they reassure us they are, that we're normal. Um, we all have aspirations, so we also read books to look at things we aspire to and how people have managed to obtain the, the things or the feelings or the situation that we would like to aspire to. Escapism, there's nothing wrong with a good escapist bit of fantasy that takes us out of all our sorrow and concerns and what's going on in our lives. Cautionary tales. Um, what happens if I make different choices? What happens to people who make choices that I'm facing and they choose left or right? How does that evolve for them? So there's also a role for cautionary tales. And then to have a sense of belonging or the fear of missing out. So if the book's on book talk and everybody's talking about it, I should be reading it too, right? Because otherwise I can't join into those conversations. So those are just a few re ideas. And no, no, no. Oh, yeah. me, okay. So I'm new at the school that I've moved to in Dubai, and so I really wanted to know about more about my students because I feel it's I, I really need to know them so that I can give them the right books. So we did a survey um, of nearly 250 students, and we said to them, "Reading is complete the sentence." And I was so happy that most of them said. Fun, fun and interesting, relaxing, nice. There were a few that said it was boring, which is inevitable, right? But generally, I thought they had a positive view on reading, which is a good way to start. A lot of them said fun if or when or fun and. And that's where I have to concentrate my efforts. So they said it's fun if I have the right book. So I have to make sure I know them and get the right book. Uh, if they enjoy it, if the book has the right style, if I have a quiet place for reading, and that really helped me as well because it could allow me and the other librarian to decide how noisy we wanted the library. So they wanted a quiet place, but they didn't want a silent place, and those two things are very different. Um, and most of all, they didn't want to have to take notes. How many of you like reading a book and then having to write something about it? 
<laughs> yeah, everybody says that. No, I just want to read and read and read and read as much as possible. And they found the books fun and calming and educational and entertaining and exciting and interesting, which I thought was wonderful. Then 26 out of my students said they found books boring, not fun, not interesting, hard, and they didn't like it. So now I know that I need to go and find those students and see how we can turn that conversation around, not by me lecturing them, not by me getting cross at them, but by me understanding them and approaching them in the right way. Um, then we ask them, when is reading hard for you? And you can see noise is a big factor, the wrong book, a lot of distractions. So a lot of them said, I have to have all my devices far away from me because otherwise I'm tempted to read a page, check something, read a page, play a game. Um, and if there's no choice, if somebody's telling me what I have to read. So that's an, another important message. And when do they like the reading? When is it the right place and time? When it's quiet, they have the right book. Before bed, a lot of them liked it and they want to be comfortable. And a few of them wanted to be alone. They didn't want people around them. So in conclusion, with our little research, we found that if you want to grow a reader, you need an early start. You need to be persistent, tenacious, you need awareness of the person. You need good communication with each other. You need sharing with the community and peers. You need to, at some point, hand over ownership and stop telling the student or child what to read. And you need to allow for the fellow re years. There will be years when students don't want to read, can't read. Um, the COVID years, there was a split. Some people could continue reading. Some people just absolutely could not read. And you have to accept that that may happen. I'm just going to add. So this thing about allowing for fallow years, both Nadine and I do have grown children who have gone past the teenage years. And um, I have two sons and a daughter. And she's a daughter and a son. But I would say this thing about they'll stop reading. There'll be those middle years, and especially during the IB diploma. I think my kids just stopped reading for pleasure, and I was really kind of concerned about it. But then it was just so, so lovely when it comes back, when they get into university or they get out of university. And one of our fellow jury members, I don't know if Suji's in the audience. Suji, you told us that there was some research that showed that if kids stop reading, that they will come back. And Nadine and I were trying. We wanted to put on a slide. You, you've got to find it. We'll put it back in the slides. We'll let everyone know. But, oh, we'll start a nice rumor. The rumor is that research shows that as long as you get kids, especially boys reading by age 12, it's okay if they stop reading in the middle years because they will return. And that's true. I'm so proud to say my son's now asking me to buy him books. And they're not just simple books. They like, I'm like, you're reading what? And he's like, yeah, because I met this guy and he'd read it. And this person in my class is reading this and that and the other. And I'm like, hallelujah, finally. <laughs> it's only taken me 19 years. But now he's reading. And he's reading good, intense books. And we're talking about books with each other. So never give up. <laughs> And celebrate, celebrate. So it's just, okay, and now I think we, look, we finished early, we rushed so much. Now we have 10 <laughs> minutes for questions. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? We could try to go back and play that video again, I guess, but yeah. if not, oh, oh, but no, we, Nadine, oh, one more slide. Yeah, so this is the important one, so that you can go and get those slides, especially the ones that went off the screen, you know, and there you go. Oh, question. Go for it. Uh, so when you did the survey for the 163 kids, was there a difference between how girls and boys perceived it? Was there a major difference? Uh, to be honest, I didn't look at gender at all. I tried to be gender blind. Um, I will be looking closer at that 16%. Got it. And I suspect it may be a majority of boys, but I, I can't tell you right now. Got it. And over the years, have you also observed different strategies or styles for what works well for boys versus what works well for girls? I, th I think this is a real societal thing, and that's why I started my Blokes with Book Club, is that um, often we gender our male 
uh, students into thinking that reading's nerdy or not cool, and they, they come under a lot of pressure to be more active outdoors, and they get valued and praised for that, often by their fathers, in fact, so it, it goes down the generations. So to break that cycle, we really wanted to show reading could be super fun and it, you could learn things that were really useful to get social currency. So with the boys I was working with, they thought it would be really, really cool to be able to do magic tricks. And so because they could do these magic tricks, then they got the social currency with their friends who weren't in the club and they were learning this through books and they were like these cool guys and they could do all these magic tricks and they knew all this stuff and um, so <laughs> that really helped and I think that helps with boys the social aspect and this thing of being cool and you're cool because you know stuff from books so yeah um, hi um, I had a we had a question and I had a question on this idea of picking the right book um, it's not just as teacher librarians to go ahead and pick the right books, but we're also like, how do you teach your uh, students that this is how you could pick the right book? And this is coming from a place where we have had, um, after the pandemic, a lot of kids have come back to the library and they are feeling overwhelmed looking at the, just the sheer amount of books suddenly they have access to because during the pandemic, it was, you know, you give them an excerpt or, you know, you send them to a digital library, which is like easy to navigate. But now to physically come back to space and be overwhelmed, how do you go and like teach them to pick yeah. the book and feel it and take it? And Okay, so I would say one thing, and, it's, and I want to clarify, we don't pick the right book. We are trying to put, we're trying to like offer a, a, a you know, healthy food in front and hope that the child will taste and try different things. I like to do book tastings in my library and we'll have like eight stations and I'll pick it probably by, I could do by genre if I want them to understand that they'll see the difference. And you set a timer and they have a, like a little, you know, a, a, a score sheet and they, and they get to go to a station and a group of five or six or eight kids have all these books on the table and I give them three minutes and they have to pick up every book and they have to judge them on three things. Because we talk about how do you judge a book? Should you judge a book by a cover, its cover? No, but do you? Yes. So you're gonna say, out of all these books on the table at this station, which one had the cover that made you wanna pick it up? Because this is about, covers are there and they're subconsciously appealing to us. The way that bright fruit on the tree is brightly colored, it's trying to attract humans. The fruit wants to be eaten. The human needs food. So which cover attracted you? Then we turn it over because they say the blurb. Okay, you turn it over. Which blurbs? These blurbs, you know, publishers try hard to make the books attractive. They want to be picked up. And books are like this you know, sedentary object in life, and they can't get up and walk around and wave their hands in your face. So they have to attract you. I don't know, again, fruit on a tree. Um, and then, and then you all, I say you open up and you read the first paragraph or you read the first page and does the opening sentence grab you and, and then when they score it and then the bell goes and you go to the next station and by the end if you've gone to eight stations and there are 10 to 12 books on a station you have come in contact with and then I say take your scorecard now go maybe everybody when you get the really good books then, then there's like well I want to read that I want to read that and said so we have a, a hold system in the library catalog you can do that so I think encouraging that you learn the way that when you're on the internet, clickbait. What is it you're clicking on? And if you watch your mind, what is it you're attracted to? And then you'll start to go and maybe see what am I not attracted to and why, but maybe that's still good. And when you change book covers, we also do sessions on looking at all the different kinds of book covers of one book to not judge a book by its cover. Um, so what I've been doing is I've been eavesdropping a lot with students and I've been trying to see the kind of things they're enjoying in their life that's non-reading things. So for example, a lot of them are watching Stranger Things um, on, on Netflix and a lot of the girls were watching The Summer I Turn Pretty. And so then what I do is I go and research or I read the book myself, or I watch a bit of the show, and then I look for book-alikes. So then um, I made a huge display on the summer when I turned pretty, and I said, okay, the summer when I learned pretty, what did you like about it? The idea of a summer romance, and I look for books that also have that topic. Um, 
having to choose between two boys, and then I find some books about that. Uh, complex family relationships or a neighbor who's ill, and I find books like that. And um, I've made a, quite a few posters on different things. Um, and then I had another one. Our counselors said, uh, you know, neurodiversity. They said, you know, we really want some books to reassure children who have dyslexia or ADHD or they... Um, have anxiety or parents who are divorcing and whatever. So then I made lots of displays that say, all brains are different, and then books with the themes, and I put a little blurb under the poster, and we have the, all the books on display. So just kind of ways of uh, people to find something that's interesting them. If a student comes and says, I don't know what to read, I say, okay, what, what was the last book you remember reading that you really enjoyed? And then we try and find something like that. Or what do you love doing in your spare time? And we try and find books that will make connections with that. And how do I know so many books? I listen to audiobooks all the time, at double speed sometimes. <laughs> I think that's kind of cheating, double speed, but you know. I cheat all the time. I have a question. So... Do, uh, like, do readers have to have an early start to become good readers in the future? Or like, can you start reading from any time or any age? C can you start what, becoming, becoming like loving reading? Yeah. yeah in your, oh, yes, yes. I, I mean, okay, how many adults in the audience, be honest, because I know I meet them, I have teachers who come in and say, I didn't learn to love to read until I was in my 20s. And in fact, until formal school finished, which I found kind of sad because then it makes it seem like the schools failed. Any adults here that became in your 20s only a real reader? Look at that, yes. So you might go and I would say, ask that adult to tell you their reading story. And what was it? Was it a right book was, or was it a right person? Or was it the, getting the right conditions? Like getting out of school, was that the condition that made somebody go, now I'm doing it for myself? Yeah, one of our teachers in, who's in her 50s and she said to me, I discovered reading over the summer and now I'd rather read than do anything else. And she said, it's because of audiobooks. She said, that opened it all up to me, and we spent lots of time in the car, and we were listening to audiobooks as a family, and we were talking about them and discussing them and anticipating what would be happening next. So for everybody, the journey is different, and it's never too late. My son, he was 19 before he started reading. Honest to God, he did the IB. We read every single I book B book to him out loud because he hated reading so much, he would not even read the books he had to read. She's and a he very was dedicated <laughs> mother. He was doing English, and he was doing Dutch as a, as a first language as well. So we had to, my bilingual, my husband had to read them to him in Dutch, and I was reading them to him in English. But we did it all together. Hey, Audible? Yeah. I have a follow-on question. Uh, as teacher librarians, we also face... Um, lot of difficulty in getting our teachers to read and I strongly believe we need to model reading. I do understand there are a lot of reasons why our teachers don't get time. Um, they get caught up with a lot of stuff which they are trying to do on their own. How do we help them? Picture books. <laughs> Seriously, picture books. It's, it's like a gateway drug. When, when teachers come and they, they're not readers and you can... A, lo a lot of our teachers have to teach advisory and social-emotional learning to their students. And I just... I give them book, picture books and I show them, you know, it's going to take you all of three minutes to read this. And then they read it and they read it with their students and they get such a great response for it. So that's one way. Audiobooks is another way. Right. We also try to make, so when every new teacher comes in, we say, we're going to make a poster for you, and it's of your favorite books, and it's going to go up in your classroom, and every single book you put on that poster, I promise I will buy, and then I'm going to put you in front of students, you're going to book talk it. And I'll tell you, I think some go home and read very quickly, because it becomes this kind of pride thing, but it's really not, and I discover so many great books, and it's like treating them as a reader, is, is and then bringing them into the library, and we give them lots of biscuits and tea and coffee and maybe a glass of wine, you know. Do go read that um, London Review of Books, The Uncommon Reader, because talk about learning to read it at a late age. It's a queen, like in her 60s, becoming a reader. 